Well, good morning. All right, so great to be back with you this morning. I can't believe you let bootleg Jesus back up here again. So last week, we looked at uh, coming to the table, right, or approaching the table. And we looked at how to approach Jesus at the table in a, in a Jesus-centered way, together in community. This week, we're going to look at going from the table. How do we proceed from the table? And where do we proceed from the table? And there was something specific I said last week that I'd like to bring up again. I said this, after, after working in international human rights for the past decade, uh, there are two places that I know I'll find Jesus. Two places in the world that I know that Jesus is already there. The table and the margins. The table and the margins. We looked at the table last Sunday. This week, we're going to look at what it looks like to go from the table to the margins. My sermon today is called From the Table to the Margins. We're called to the table, yes, but we're not called to just stay at the table. We're called to move from the table to the margins. Now, before I jump in, I want to clarify something. Here's what I'm not saying. I am not saying that we take Jesus with us from the table to the margins. Because Jesus is already on the margins. So the question isn't whether or not Jesus is on the margins. The question is whether or not we have the eyes to see Jesus on the margins. And being with Jesus at the table prepares us to be with Jesus on the margins. So what does it look like to go from the table to the margins? Let's read Jesus' words in his Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said this. He said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a lamp, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That was the NIV, uh, the New International Version. Here's the NIV, the New Indian Version. You are the masala of the earth. But if the masala loses its masala-ness, it's not a perfect translation, how can it be made masala again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. But let's switch back to the NIV, the legit NIV. You are the light of the world. Now, I don't want us to skim past this text because this is kind of a big deal. Jesus tells his disciples, anyone who follows him, that we are the light of the world. Now, we here as city folks in the 21st century West are so accustomed to seeing light. But Jesus says this to a Middle Eastern audience, with, uh, to a Jewish audience, to, uh, with a very specific understanding of light. First off, he says this to an audience uh, that didn't know what electricity was. But more specifically, Jesus says this to a Jewish audience that had a unique understanding of light. Their understanding of light went all the way back to Genesis 1, when God created something beautiful out of nothing and said, let there be light. And light led to life, because light always leads to life. And now here's Jesus saying, you are the light. You 
or the life. It's like Jesus passing on the baton to his disciples and saying, back in my day, when I was there at the beginning of time, we said, let there be light. And there was light. Today I say unto you, you are the light. You are the light of the world. So go be the light. And go bring life to the, life, to the most lifeless places on earth. And then he goes on to say, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, I was raised in a Christian tradition in India that taught me explicitly to do good deeds so that others would see my good deeds and glorify my Father in heaven or understand the goodness of God through my good deeds. How are people going to know that I'm a Christian in a non-Christian society unless there's something different about me? And not different in like an isolationist weird way, but different because I'm bringing salt and light to the most lifeless spaces around me. I'm bringing value to the most dead places around me as a Christian. To live such lives of goodness and grace and love and compassion and justice, that people would see that there was something different about me as a Christian. And that people would see that there was something different about us as a people. So that they would see the goodness of God through our light, through our salt. But you know what? When I moved to the West, I heard a very different presentation of the gospel. A presentation of the gospel that said that Jesus cares way more about my spiritual needs than my physical needs. That my spiritual salvation was more important to Jesus than my earthly liberation. That Jesus cares more, that Jesus cares way more about the salvation of my soul than the well being of my human body. Here's a quote from an American celebrity pastor just a few years ago. <clears throat> he said this, he said, there's a pile of dead bodies behind the Mars Hill bus. Mars Hill was the name of his church. He said, there's a pile of dead bodies behind the church's bus. And by God's grace, it'll be a mountain by the time we're done. You either get on the bus or you get run over by the bus. Those are the two options. Let me give you a moment to process that or throw up in your mouth if you need to do that. Because the reality is that many of us have left toxic, abusive church spaces with toxic, abusive church leaders who said things like this, who said that the salvation of people's souls mattered more than the well-being of their staff or their well-being of their volunteers' bodies or their community's bodies. Where does this theology come from? Where does this theology that teaches us to suppress our light and our good deeds come from? Where does this theology that, that is okay with throwing bodies behind the bus so that souls get saved, where does this theology come from? I'll tell you where it comes from. It comes from a very dark place. This dark, dark place that my people are all too familiar with. Colonization. Colonization. You see, we cannot talk about being a light to people on the margins without first talking about the problem that has pushed billions of people around the world into the margins in the first place. Colonization. We cannot talk about international human rights without first talking about why we need international human rights in the 21st century, because we live in a post-colonial world. We cannot talk about racism or residential schools or First Nations justice issues today without first talking about the reality of colonization that has shaped these issues today. 
As Christians, our love for people on the margins should push us to uncomfortable places. It should push us to uncomfortable places in understanding why people on the margins are on the margins in the first place. And for us as a 21st century church, so much of that is because of colonization, whether we realize it or not. So what, what is colonization? How do we define this weighty word? Here's a, here's a definition that I've found to be helpful. Uh, this is from Walter Mignolo. And uh, he says, colonialism is a practice of domination, which involves the subjugation of one people by another. <clears throat> you see, colonization has always been around. It's always been around all over the world. But the system of modern colonization that has shaped much of the world that we live in today in the 21st century uh, began in the 15th and 16th centuries with the European military conquest of the world and the violent subjugation of its people. It was marked by slavery, the extraction of raw materials, repressive rule, and the creation of social authority structures based on external outward characteristics that came to be known as race. You see, it's impossible to understand racism without understanding this history and system that's associated with its origin for our world today. Now, European colonization raged throughout the world for hundreds of years. And during this time, Europe developed itself, participated in all types of human rights violations, and set up racialized class hierarchies with themselves at the top and indigenous and enslaved people at the bottom. Now, millions of people were killed in service to the European quest for world dominance and extreme wealth, and populations were moved all over the world to meet its ever-increasing desires. Now, European colonization mostly ended by the mid-20th century, about 70 years ago, 67 years ago. But the effects of colonization remain today in the form of rampant poverty all over the world, global hunger, and civil unrest in the destabilized former colonies, like what we're seeing right now in the Middle East, or what we saw a few decades ago in Rwanda. But also race-based hierarchies in the former colonies, like the United States and Canada. You know, as a child of colonization, as someone born and raised in a country that only threw out our colonial oppressors in 1947, 77 years ago, colonization isn't an academic concept for my community. It's a lived experience. You see, my family has lived firsthand the effects of colonization. The shameful injustice of colonization wasn't that long ago. For example, my grandparents were born in colonized India. My great-grandparents spent uh, most of their lives in colonized India. In fact, Queen Elizabeth, who recently passed away, became second in line to the throne while India was still colonized in 1936. And most of Africa was decolonized during her reign from the 1950s to the 1970s. Now, here's something else that'll blow your mind. Portugal's first colony in Asia in the year 1510, was Goa, today in India, uh, just a few hours south of where I grew up in Mumbai. Do you know when the Portuguese left India? December 1961, the first year of John F. Kennedy's presidency. Not that long ago. Now, some of you are wondering, Joash, where was the Western church when all of this happened? Was the Western church silent? Well, actually, no. The Western church wasn't silent. In fact, the Western church and most Western Christians were largely on the side of the colonial empires. And it wasn't just the Catholic church. Now, yes, the Roman Catholic church fully backed the colonizing efforts of 
the French, the Italians, the Spanish, the Portuguese, but they weren't the only ones. The Dutch Reformed Church backed the Dutch colonizers. The Church of England, the Anglican Church, backed the British Empire. In fact, in repenting of its support for colonization in recent years, the Church of England has publicly admitted, publicly admitted that much of its wealth, the church's wealth, was built on the backs of people in slavery and colonization. Think about that. Last but not the least, Southern Baptists, Southern Presbyterians in the United States supported colonization with their support for slavery and segregation. Willie James Jennings is a black American theologian, and he says this in his book, The Christian Imagination. He says that the Western Christian tradition has been deeply shaped by a colonial mindset, a mindset that has marginalized and devalued non-European cultures and people. He also argues that this colonial imagination has influenced how Christians understand God, humanity, and the world, often reinforcing systems of power and oppression. And that's exactly why we're doing what we're doing this morning. We're reimagining Christianity Jesus' way, Jesus' way, so that we can love our neighbors on the margins better. You see, injustice isn't just bad for the oppressed. It's also bad for the oppressor and those on their side. And this is, this is actually the premise of the book I'm working on right now, which is basically that the injustice of colonization didn't just shape the rest of the world. It also shaped us as the Western church to resist justice today. It's shaped us as the Western church to resist the Holy Spirit's work of justice for our marginalized neighbors, even here in the West. So now that we know what the darkness of colonization looks like and how it still shapes our theology today, our faith today, how do we as Christians be a salt and light in our post-colonial world today? How do we embody Jesus to our marginalized neighbors all over the world today? And how do we decolonize our faith so that we can prioritize justice for our marginalized neighbors, Jesus' way? I'd like to offer us with three ways to decolonize our faith. Number one, we prioritize the liberation of human bodies. We prioritize the liberation of human bodies. You see, colonized theology would have us believe that Jesus cares way more about the salvation of our souls than the well-being of our bodies. And this kind of teaching had been prevalent all throughout the history of the Western Evangelical Church. Why? Because so much of the Western Evangelical Church got its theology from church leaders who owned people in slavery or who were okay with colonizing people around the world. And they didn't see that as conflicting their Christian faith as church leaders. Here's one example of that. Anyone ever hear of the slave Bible? It's a thing. You can actually Google search this. It's called a slave Bible. And it was basically a Bible that slaveholders in America would give their slaves uh, to, to introduce them to Christianity, uh, to save their souls. But at the same time, what's unique about the slave Bible is that entire sections of the Bible were removed from the slave Bible, like Exodus or the Old Testament prophets, because these slave owners didn't want people in slavery getting ideas that God is on the side of people on the margins, that God is on the side of people being oppressed. And, you know, the entire book of Exodus is about God freeing people from slavery, the people of Israel. And they didn't want their people to be exposed to the side of God. So they took entire parts of the Bible out. Now, this is also why the Anglican Church in India took out the Magnificat or 
uh, Mary's song that we see in Luke chapter 1. Uh, they took that out from the Anglican Book of Common Prayer in India. Specifically, Mary's words from Luke chapter 1, verse 53, where she says, He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. Because there were regular famines all across India, with millions of people dying of hunger. And this happened because the British Empire would force Indian farmers to, to export their, their products instead of growing food for their families. By the way, this, this teaching of God caring more about the salvation of souls than the liberation of human bodies persists in the Western church today. I gave you one example of that earlier with that quote. But I'll also say this, I work for the world's largest anti-human trafficking organization. And I lead our church partnerships teams uh, all across Canada. And I cannot begin to tell you the number of Canadian pastors that refuse to support our work, our work of literally rescuing children from human trafficking because we don't do spiritual evangelism. And there's a reason we don't do that. It's because it's not trauma-informed. It's, not, uh, it's, it's quite manipulative to actually impose your religion upon someone who's in a vulnerable state of mind, who, who, a child who's just been rescued from trafficking. It's not the Jesus thing to do. So we don't do that. But, but a, lot of, a lot of Canadian church leaders don't get that. In fact, um, I can't begin to tell you the number of Canadian pastors who tell my team, right after my team shares stories with them of uh, children being abused to 20 times a day. And, and, and I quote, they say to my team, what's the point of rescuing children from slavery if their souls go to hell? Aren't they dead in the water anyway? Where does this theology come from? It comes from colonization. It comes from Western church leaders who were okay with owning people in slavery. It comes from some of the European Protestant reformers who had zero concerns about executing their enemies who, who believed different things about Jesus. Because souls mattered more than bodies. Well, let's, let's contrast that now with the life of Jesus of Nazareth, a victim of colonization himself who was ultimately executed by his colonial masters in an unjust way. Jesus said this in his first words in public ministry in Luke chapter 4. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. Just as a side note, how many of us have heard Western preachers preach this text and explain it as, well, Jesus only meant the spiritually poor and the spiritually oppressed? Well, actually, no. If you look at the original Greek, uh, the Greek text would disagree with them because the word for poor here in the Greek is the word pedokos. And pedokos literally means people who are physically poor and physically oppressed. And for those of us who've heard this text explained away with, well, Jesus didn't come to set the oppressed free. If that was the case, he would have liberated the Jewish people from the Roman Empire. Well, yeah, Jesus wasn't a Christian nationalist. And Jesus did say that we, we would do greater things than him. We, the church, would do greater things than him. He said that in the Gospels. But don't take my word for it. Just look at Jesus' life and ministry after he declares these words in Luke. What does Jesus do right after he sa says this? He heals people. He sets people free from demon possession. He feeds hungry people. He raises the dead back to life. Because Jesus cares about both the physical and the spiritual. 
And because Jesus' good news is both. It's spiritual and physical. We cannot separate the two. If Jesus' good news or gospel was just spiritual, then the resurrection of Jesus being raised from the dead would have never happened. Because the resurrection is first and foremost a physical event. It's an event of Jesus defeating death, a current physical reality, as all of us who have lost loved ones know. But Jesus defeating death also points to a future physical reality, the resurrection of life. Because what God has done for Jesus, he'll also do for us. And what God will do for us, he'll also do for all of creation one day. Here's the second way we decolonize our faith so that we can love our neighbors on the margins better. We right what's wrong by prioritizing justice. We right what's wrong by prioritizing justice. Here's the thing. All of us have inherited a beautiful faith from imperfect people. A beautiful faith from imperfect people, myself included. You see, just as many European and North American ancestors had a blind spot towards colonization, my Indian Christian ancestors had a blind spot too. They had a blind spot towards casteism. Now, what do we do with that? We can't, we can't change the past. We can't change about what we've inherited. But we can be faithful in the present. We can follow Jesus in the present with what we've been entrusted with in a faithful way. What does Zacchaeus, someone who has benefited from the oppression of others, do after having an encounter with Jesus in Luke chapter 19? He writes what's wrong by prioritizing justice. Here's what he says in verse 8. Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Here's how Jesus responds in verse 9. Jesus says to him, Today, salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. Jesus affirms Zacchaeus' newfound faith, because this is what it means to follow Jesus of Nazareth. To write what's wrong by prioritizing justice. So what does it look like for a Western church, for Western Christians who have benefited from colonization to right what's wrong with communities of those who have suffered the effects of colonization? Because here's the thing. Whether we realize it or not, we're all beneficiaries of colonization, including myself, by the way. Now, yes, I am also a child of colonization, but I became a beneficiary of colonization the day I moved to America. And then when I moved to Canada after that. And like you, I have also benefited off of historically stolen wealth and land here in Canada. Jesus said, where your money is, there your heart will be also. I would add, where your money is, there your theology is also. Maybe we could go a step further and look at our own budgets. How are we spending our money? How much are we spending on ourselves? How much are we hoarding for ourselves in, in real estate or stock options or savings accounts? Now, I'm not, saying that we, I'm not saying that we shouldn't save for a rainy day. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what does it look like for us to be faithful with our household budgets in a way that prioritizes justice for our marginalized neighbors? For example, Western Christians have given generously towards spiritual evangelism for many, many years. But if we as Western Christians have benefited from colonization, uh, shouldn't we also give generously to justice work? Wouldn't that be the Zacchaeus thing to do? Because from the perspective of a fundraiser 
uh, for a Christian justice organization, I can tell you for a fact that Canadian Christians have been blessed with way more than we currently give to the work of justice. And as someone who grew up in the global south, I'll also say this. My family has been Christian for 2,000 years. The Apostle Thomas brought the gospel to us. The church in my country is growing today. It's one of the fastest growing churches in the world. And that's because of the Holy Spirit, because of local leadership. You know what we really need? We need safe communities. We need stronger justice systems that are redeemed to work for people who are poor. For example, in South Asia, you're statistically more likely to be struck by lightning than ever be convicted in a court of law for trafficking a child. Let me give you a moment to process that. In many countries in Central America, more than 90%, 90% of sexual violence cases against women and children never get reported. Why? Because these justice systems were set up by colonial powers to protect colonial interests. They were never really set up to serve women and children, especially women and children from poor and indigenous communities. And in addition to that, what would it look like for us to prioritize resourcing the work of justice in our communities, especially towards our black and First Nations neighbors? Here's a third way we decolonize our faith. Learn from Christians on the margins. Learn from Christians on the margins. You see, the beautiful thing about the table is that the table levels the playing field. We're all equal in Christ when we come to the table. And we're all equal in Christ when we leave from the table. We all have things to learn from each other. And we all need each other. And we all need Christians from the margins to teach us. Who are the Christian voices who have shaped your understanding of Jesus the most? Who are the Christian authors, podcasters, inf Instagram influencers that you listen to? Is your list of Christian teachers diverse? Or are you only learning about Jesus from one category of the church, white American men? Now, there's nothing wrong with learning about Jesus from white American men. Some of my favorite authors are white American men. But there's so much more that we miss out when we only learn from them. Because the global church is beautifully diverse. It's beautifully diverse, and we miss out on understanding Jesus when we only learn about Jesus from one small category of the global church. So learn from Canadian teachers. Learn from female teachers. Learn from black Bible teachers, from Asian preachers. Learn from LGBTQ Christian authors. Now, you don't have to agree with everything that they say, but hear them out. Hear them out and, and wrestle with their unique perspective that's shaped from being with Jesus on the margins. Because they have a very unique understanding of Jesus that we need. Wrestle with what they're saying, with their lived experiences and oppression, but also in their hope. Also in their hope and perspective on the beauty of God in the midst of their suffering. And better yet, let's create holy spaces of wrestling in our communities, in our small groups and Bible studies and discipleship groups and gatherings to lean into the bad news of injustice so that we can fully appreciate the good news of Jesus. Good news for the poor, for the oppressed, for the captive. I know so many Western Christians who leave the faith 
Because all their teachers, all their teachers are only from a small category of the global church. What if, what if they had been exposed to other teachers as well who taught them about Jesus from marginalized eyes? Especially Christian teachers from marginalized communities. Would they still be in the faith today? We'll never know. A few years ago, I experienced a lot of trauma in the Southern American church. I was actually very close to walking away from the church entirely. Do you know what I did in that season, just to switch things up a little bit? I started listening to black preachers online. That's what I started doing. I started diversifying who I was following on Instagram. I started reading female authors. I read a lot of female authors in that season. And I kid you not, it saved my faith. Like it literally saved my faith. Because I started to experience a new side of Jesus. A side of Jesus I hadn't been exposed to before. A Jesus who understands my suffering and a Jesus who feels near in my suffering because he knows what it's like to suffer. And our suffering neighbors see Jesus in that unique light. Friends, if, if, if this is something you're interested in pursuing, I've actually passed along uh, a diverse list of authors uh, and podcasters, and Instagram accounts that you can also learn from. And uh, we'll make that list available to you, actually, through the midweek email that gets sent out. So you haven't subscribed for that. This is your friendly reminder to do that. Friends, if, if what I'm sharing with you today sounds radical, it's because the work of the Holy Spirit is radical. What does the Holy Spirit do in the New Testament church. The Holy Spirit topples the old order of things to make way for God's new creation. This is what the Spirit does. And God is always doing something new. Always. He's always making things new in our time. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is still moving today. And just like it did in the early church, if we have the eyes to see, and if we have the ears to hear and the hearts to understand. And those hearts get formed with Jesus at the table in community. Let me invite Noah to come back up and uh, create some space for us. I won't call it house music this time. Uh, but... Noah will just create some space for us. And on the screen is a reflection question. And take a moment and process this for yourself. Ask yourself this question in silence and reflect on it. How is Jesus leading me to go from the table to the margins this week? Let me give us a few moments to process this. The prayer team is here if you need prayer or if you'd like to process anything. And let me send us out with this benediction. 
receive this. The almighty and merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us for this day and for the rest of this week. Amen. Go in peace.